Hello. So today we're really lucky because we have Ali Bajanov Challen from King's Business School, um, who's going to talk to us a little bit about career regret, which is relevant to the last couple of lectures that we've had. So Ali, we've looked at cha the changing kind of patterns of work mm -hmm. and how that affected organisations, and also we've started to touch on kind of like the individualiz individualization of the career and how people are starting to experience different careers within organizations and how this has also led um, people to suggest that the career anchors that people have have also changed since the 1980s and they've become, um, or the younger generations have become a bit more interested in things like work-life balance or um, autonomy. But one of the things that we haven't covered that I know that you're interested in is this idea of career regret. And I know you and I were just talking before about this possibly not being something that's been studied a lot in the past. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what career regret is. Yeah, absolutely. So career regret is something, as the name suggests, um, whereby people regret something specific about their career. So you have negative feelings about decisions that you've made in the course of your career. Um, the stuff that I do in terms of career regret is quite specific. So I look at something called occupational regret. And so again, as the label suggests, this is where you would have um, a regret about the decision that you've made um, in respect of the occupation that you've chosen. So, you know, if you've decided to become a pharmacist, I regret making that decision. Um, and so it doesn't always have to be tied to a profession, but quite often what we see with the research that we do is that it is. Mm -hmm. And so just to give you a little bit more about regret and exactly what that looks like, it's linked to a decision. Um, but what, what some of the defining features are are that it um, is linked to self-blame. So you blame yourself for a particular decision that you've taken that you know was within your control to take. Um, and it's also linked to this feeling of wanting to undo that. So if I said to you, um, you know, Mandy, if you could turn back the clock and, and choose not to be an academic, uh, what would you say? And if you said, you know, I, I would undo that decision, then that suggests that you probably regret that decision. Mm. Um, and there's lots of causes of occupational regret. Do you want me to to outline some of those? Yeah, that would be great. Um, and also, I was just wondering as well about this idea of choice, because yeah. I think, you know, we were talking earlier about how in the past people had this, or it's argued that people had this traditional career yeah. and that maybe you join an organisation when you're quite young um, and then you kind of go through the ranks of the hierarchy. Whereas maybe now, because of the kind of the, this new deal where you're supposed to kind of get employability and have these experiences, but you're not guaranteed a career path anymore um, and there's lots of new jobs emerging that there might be an element of choice relating to this whereas people maybe think more about what it is that they really want out of life rather yeah. than you know what they're expected to do do you think that comes yeah. into it there's, there's a couple of things that I think you've said there well one is obviously we did used to kind of almost inherit occupations so what did you know my grandfather do my, my father do and whatever and obviously things have changed so massively now where we have so much more choice um, but I think linked to that idea of choice as well is that we're so much more aware of the variety of choice that we have. Um, so, you know, when you and I were choosing a, a career path, it was kind of the very traditional things, you know, that you would know about when you were leaving your school. So it would be, oh, you can become a doctor, you can become a lawyer, you can become an accountant. Um, but now there's sort of, you know, really vast knowledge of all the different things that you could do but all of the different things that you're not going to do because you've chosen X path. Yeah. So almost the amount of choice that you have um, has given you almost more, more reasons to regret the path that you do take because you're aware of everything else. Like an so opportunity that, cost almost. Exactly, exactly that. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that people tend to regret more these days because they're more aware of what else they could have done. But I also think, and I think this is relevant to, to you know, your, your cohort who are watching this, is this idea around not really completely understanding ourselves when we go into the, well, just before we go into the workplace. And so in the literature, there's something called vocational identity. Mm. And that's basically where you are, or you have, if you've got a strong vocational identity, you kind of understand your interests, you understand your abilities, your strengths, your kind of educational interests, your goals, those sorts of things. And because of that, you make a choice that is fitting um, but often at this stage of our lives we don't have that self-knowledge we don't understand fully that you know this is what I value and therefore this this kind of career would fit really well with that um, I suppose the other thing as well is is having a sort of good sense of what an occupation is really like and I think again that's an area where people 
they have a, a, a certain um, a certain understanding that they've built up in their minds, but when they get into the workplace and they start working as a, you know, an X or a Y or a Z, the reality is very different. And so they don't have what we call a, a realistic job preview. And so actually you thought you were going into one thing and you find you're going into something completely different or, you know, at least different enough that it makes you regret your choice. Um, I think the other thing as well, that's perhaps more pertinent now than ever before is just the change. So if you think about technology and how that's changing occupations. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, people will go into an occupation at the beginning of their career and that will, the occupation and the nature of it will change because of technology, yeah. um, because of our changing values, because of the way that, you know, various factors mean that things are done differently. And so the occupation that you go into at the beginning of your career isn't the one that you're so you find yourself in like you know 10 15 20 years later so even for, for us you know you think back to when we became academics you didn't have access to journals online you had to go to a library and go through some sort of you know fusty books and stuff and I remember the dust exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> and the dark rooms and the, yeah um so it's very different and so again you know it might be that you get into a, a career path that changes and and actually, this isn't what I signed up for. Um, one of the last things I think I'll mention, just because, I, again, I think you see a lot of this and it's, it's worth sort of dwelling on for people who are making decisions now, um, is that we often succumb to pressure from those around us. Yeah. So I've chosen to become a pharmacist because that's what my parents really wanted me to do. Um, and so that external pressure to, you know, really, I don't know, meet other people's expectations means that, and all of these things ultimately mean that we end up in um, a sort of an occupation that in some way isn't a good fit for us. And that's where the regret comes from. So do you find that, um, I don't know if, the, if in the research or even some kind of anecdotal evidence, do you find that people act on their regret? Um, yeah, so in different ways though, and this is, this is a good question actually, because some of the research that we're doing at the moment, so I'm doing some work with a, a guy called Chris Woodrow from Henley Business School. And so we're looking, we've interviewed about 50 people and we're looking at the way that people respond to regret. Um, and what we find is that there, there are very different ways that people respond to regret, different kind of profiles, if you like. Mm -hmm. And some are much more constructive and some are, you know, far less constructive. Um, but what you see is that most people who have occupational regrets will go through cycles. So they'll go through cycles where they feel that regret um, much more at certain times. Um, and then where I talk about, you know, how people respond as being more constructive or less constructive, it's at those times where things trigger that regret. And so that could be things like, you know, bad working relationship. It could be that you're working really long hours, um, it could be that you're talking to your friend who's, you know, doing really well in their career and you kind of that comparison triggers it for you. Um, but, you know, the people who respond constructively, they use that regret to help them make change, basically. Um, and so change to address what's really going on. So the cause of their regret. But what we see on the other side is people who don't use it constructively. And so they keep cycling through that regret um, and they don't deal with the cause of the regret. They deal with the effects of the regret. So it might be that actually I, you know, I'm going to spend lots of money on handbags because that, you know, makes me feel better. So I can put the regret to one side or you know, things like that that aren't dealing with what's causing the regret, but it's just dealing with the effect of it. That's really interesting, especially considering aspects. I mean, you gave some, some great examples there of things that can trigger regret. So I'm assuming that regret is kind of always dormant there if you're maybe not in the right profession. Yeah. There are things that organisations can do to contribute to you being triggered. So, and this is interesting because we've also looked at um, recently the psychological contract. Yeah. We've been looking at this kind of notion that contracts maybe are becoming a bit more transactional, or if you're going to be positive about it, a bit more balanced in that you get maybe some more employ employability for yeah. the effort that you put in, if, put in, if not career progression. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of things might organizations or even, I mean, I know another, the final thing we were looking at in the last lecture is the role of the kind of leader or the change agent or whatever in managing some of the, the new dynamics that are at play in the, in the workforce. So what kind of things might leaders need to be aware of in yeah. terms of career regret of their employees? Well, one of the difficult things about career regret or occupational regret is that, um, and this is from the research that we're doing at the moment, is very few people will be honest about it in the workplace. So it's not that I'm gonna be go to my boss and say, you know, I actually don't think I, you know, I wish I hadn't chosen this career and here I am and I hate it. Um, 
So from a leadership perspective, it can be really difficult to understand that that's what's going on. Um, but I do think the owner should be on the leader to try and understand if this is what's underlying some of the sort of more negative behaviours. And we can, you, we can talk about how um, regret manifests itself in a minute if you want. Mm. Um, but I think from a, a leadership perspective, if you can understand what the cause is, or if you can understand that it's regret and then understand what the cause is, um, then you can take steps as a leader to try and help mitigate against those things. And so it might be that, you know, changing occupation isn't a realistic step for this person for lots of reasons. You know, people feel locked in, they feel like they've got loads of sunk costs, um, you know, you've paid for a degree, you've spent lots of time, whatever. But where the leader does have some leeway is, okay, how can I change or shape the environment for this person in such a way that um, you're mitigating against some of those things that really is at the crux of why they don't like doing what they're doing or why they feel in the wrong place. Um, so it might not, you know, it might not solve the regret, but it might go some way to mitigating against it um, for, for that individual. Um, the other thing as well, as you say, and I don't think this is just about regret, but I think it's, you know, it goes a bit, a bit more deeply is that thing around psychological contracts. So as a leader, if you're breaching psychological contracts, that in and of itself is problematic. But if you're doing that with somebody who already regrets the occupation that they're in, that has you know, a really important knock-on effect because not only have I just had my psychological contract breached, but it's reminded me why I hate being in this occupation. And that has loads of implications you know, for, for other things. So that's a really important message, I think, for, for leaders. I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to manage people in, well, for, especially for more established, old-fashioned, maybe, or more traditional but nice leadership behaviours. Um, so what would you argue are probably the most beneficial types of behaviour as a leader to exude in a, in a kind of modern workplace? Um, I think it goes back to moving away from the sort of old fashioned command and control. Basically, everybody in an organization, I mean, I don't know if, you, if you've covered this in your module or whether some of the people watching this will have covered this in the degree, but it goes back to that thing around um, job demands and job stress levels and all of those things. So what do I have within my power as a leader to make your life as an employee better or happier or more fulfilling well one thing is around autonomy so going away from that kind of command and control micromanagement type leadership behavior much more towards uh you know giving people autonomy and making them feel like they're actually contributing to something that's meaningful for them so you know part of that process the onus is on you then as a leader to care about what is important to your employees and to make meaning so we talk about meaning making in the leadership um, module that make meaning for them. So how can I um, help you as an employee feel like you're part of something that is important to you? That requires the modern day leader to have you know, a lot of time and energy to put into that, yeah. um, showing curiosity and wanting you know, to, your team to, to care and those sorts of things. So, so it requires a lot, but I think they're the kinds of leaders who will get more out of their employees. And I guess that points towards the fact that actually while it's very important to have leaders that do this you also need a kind of organizational environment that's going to support leaders in those kind of behaviors mm -hmm. and if you don't have the right kind of environment you're not going to be able to foster those kind of behaviors in leaders because they're probably too stressed or they have you know they don't have the time like you yeah. explained for curiosity anyway i think that's probably all we've got time for but thank you so much for participating no and problem. sharing your knowledge with us and I'm sure everybody really appreciates it. You're welcome. Good to talk. Good to talk.